Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to the second session on wildfire planning for farmers and ranchers. Uh, if you were able to partake in last week's step session, we uh, outlined the farm plan, farm guide, and workbook. And today uh, we're more focused on uh, the elements of the plan and, and risk reduction. So I would like to begin by acknowledging that we're on the land on which I, the land on which I reside, and I'm presenting today from the unceded territory of the Coast Salish people, including the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Um, as I said, this is part B of our workshop series, and uh, this series is sponsored by the Climate Action Initiative of BC. And I'd just like you to point their website to their website. They have. Uh, numerous resources available to producers to um, assist them in dealing with um, building their wildfire plans and assisting them with information from agencies and uh, other resources that are available. And we can talk about that a little bit more as we go through today's session. If you didn't participate last week, my name is Bruce Blackwell. I run a small consulting uh, firm in North Vancouver, BA Blackwell and Associates Limited. I've been involved in this project uh, since about 2015. We've uh, done all kinds of work with ranchers and farmers and included them in discussions about elements of wildfire planning and wildfire protection on ranches and farms. And our sponsor again, as I said, is the Climate and Agriculture Initiative of BC. So just to recap, last week's session, part A of the workshop series, uh, we talked about a plan. Why is the plan important? Understanding wildfire threats and impacts to your operation, uh, agency and producer roles in a wildfire, introduction to resources available for planning and preparation, and that included an outline of the farm and ranch guide and workbook. Uh, we highlighted the videos and the BC Wildfire Service and the BC Fire Smart resources that are available to producers. And we outlined the necessary steps to creating uh, and customizing your farm or ranch wildfire plan. Uh, specifically last week's focused on operational mapping and inventories of equipment, livestock, and those sorts of things. So uh, thank you to everybody that attended last week and, and hopefully um, you enjoy the follow-up session today. So today's agenda, part B, is really focused on uh, key considerations for risk reduction on agricultural properties, which includes reducing combustibles, using fire smart materials, planning for sprinkler protection, and best practices unique to agriculture. Uh, we're going to talk about safety and legal considerations when burning. Other planning and preparation considerations, including information sources during a wildfire, the three phases of evacuation, uh, creating a fire break ahead of a fire on your property. We'll talk about backup power. Uh, then we're going to go into livestock protection planning for main options and consideration. Uh, we'll talk about employee and visitor evacuations, so consideration for operations with multiple properties, seasonal workers, or agro-tourism on their property. And we'll close with a discussion on insurance, damage assessment, and recovery after a wildfire. So I, I, the other thing I want to highlight is we sent an email to all registrants with a link to the session recording and other key resources, including useful and helpful websites um, that uh, this today's presentation will be posted there um, hopefully shortly after the, re the, the session today uh, it might be might be another day or, or two but we hope to have that up uh, for you to have as a resource if you have any uh, follow-up thoughts or questions on, on what we present today we'll start into risk reduction on agricultural properties um, and really, there's three main focuses uh, that you can, you, you can think about. And there's three sections in the guide and workbook. 
One is reducing combustible materials on your facility. So that's specifically focused on vegetation management and landscaping to change the vegetation and the fuel type density and setback from each of your structures. structures. Uh, it's the most immediate thing you can do and the most easily e easy thing to achieve in protecting your priority structures. Last week, we talked about priority structures uh, as part of the, the plan, identifying those. And those are the ones that you're gonna really focus on reducing those combustibles, but ideally you're doing it on all of your facilities. Um, the other big one is the use of uh, fire resistant materials and ultimately rating rated roofing is really one of the most important things that you can do. Um, rated roofing means that if you have a spot fire uh, or spotting happening on your facility, those spots aren't going to land on your roof and start the roof on fire. And so using these fire resistant materials are really an approach to hardening off your strategic assets in, in infrastructure and reducing the potential for fire ignition and for fire to spread to and from the building. Um, obviously, you're not gonna go and change your roof, all your roofing today, but if, if you don't have rated roofing now, the focus is on changing it over time when you next re-roof the structure. Um, so, so ideally, if you've got wood roofing, um, you're changing that to a rated material and rated materials are duroid, um, clay tiles, anything that doesn't burn. And, and we call them class A and class B materials. Um, and, and generally the re-roofing issue is a longer term one um, that you focus on as you upgrade your facilities. The third element in terms of risk reduction on property is planning for sprinkler protection. So whether that's sprinkler, sprinkler protection that you uh, facilitate on your facility yourself or whether identifying priority sprinkler protection if you're triaged by um, a sprinkler, sprinkler protection unit during, um, during that, that fire event. So really what you're thinking about is what are the key structures you wanna focus on protecting? Cause it's, it's often that not all structures can be protected through sp the sprinkler protection units that are brought on by BC Wildfire Service. They have many priorities. So they may be only able to, 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 to protect one or two key structures on your property. And the other is thinking about, well, um, would, would you sprinkle them yourself? And if you were going to do that, how you would do that? And again, you're going to focus on critical structures that are vulnerable due to non-fire rated materials, especially roofing and siding, and that are really a priority to your operation. And why do we think about sprinkling? Well, sprinkling creates a humidity bubble around that building. And the humidity is elevated to a level through sprinkling that when that ember shower rains down with um, lots of burning material, that burning material is extinguished as it enters that sprinkler bubble of protection. And it's a very effective way of mitigating uh, fire ignitions of structures um, as long as they're not immediately up against a burning forest or another burning building. So you wanna understand how wildfires can move from surrounding forest or grassland on to your ranch or um, farm facility. Um, so sparks and embers, burning debris, are, they can be thrown up to two kilometers ahead of a wildfire. I, I, I should qualify that, you know, in Australia, they've seen ember showers spread as far as 25 kilometers. And BC, we have seen longer than two kilometers, but two kilometers is a pretty significant fire if we're getting embers that far. And so um, basically this infographic that you can see here, there's, there's, a, uh, there's a link on the website that actually shows the fire burning um, in this picture and demonstrates the three forms of ignition, which are embers, radiant heat, and direct flame content. So on the left, you can see uh, a large wildfire burning and you can see some little red dots above that, 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 that fire flame. And those are embers that are being cast into the atmosphere 
and ultimately you can see those little red dots slightly in, in, in the right hand photo being landing onto the ranch property and they start individual fires. So in this example, you can see that, that there's, a, there's an ember uh, cast um, potentially onto the tree on the right and onto the roof. And then that's using the conduit of fence lines and other trees and other buildings to spread around the property. So when you're thinking about risk reduction, you're thinking about eliminating those pathways that can be, uh, can conduct ember showers. You're thinking about reducing the potential for radiant heat next to your structure or, or direct flame contact. And uh, so this video is on the CIA website um, and it's under the, the wildfire mitigation for farm and ranch. Um, BC Fire Smart also has information similar to this. And um, the BC Fire Smart manual has really a lot of great infographics and explanations of how wildfires grow, spread, and why homes and structures burn. And really understanding that is fundamental for you to develop the protection plans to protect your facilities uh, on your operation. So again, when we're looking at Fire Smart, here we can see the ignition hazards in embers, direct flame contact and through trees burning. We can see the vegetation fuels and hazard ignition zones and the structure hazards that exist there. So the fire hazard assessment should be focused on the vegetation hazards. So are uh, there vegetation and other fuels, wood piles, propane tanks around structures that could easily ignite? Uh, is there contiguous fuel between your structures and adjacent wildland? So you, again, you're considering vegetation type, density, and setback from the structure. If you move into the structure and you look at the specific structure hazards, you're looking at whether those building materials are fire resistant, as I've, as I've just talked about, and do they meet the design of fire smart standards, or are structures vulnerable to fire? Again, that, that roofing is, is probably the most important element that you think about because science studies have shown that uh, rated roofing gives you a, a, a very high um, 90, 95% chance that your structure is gonna survive that wildfire uh, in an ember shower. And again, we talk about ignition hazards. So you wanna take all the necessary precautions to prevent, veg uh, prevent accidental accidental ignition. So uh, you want to make sure that any open burning is done safely. Is the vegetation cleared well back from power lines, fuel lines, propane tanks, and other fuel, su fuel supplies that, that are hazardous? And is there adequate water and equipment to put out an accidental fire? And then the final element is, is access management. Does the operation have an, an adequate number of safe evacuation routes and access routes for firefighters. And you wanna assess the routes for egress and evacuation to and from the key strategic structures on the operation to make sure that there's safe uh, avenues in and out and that protection resources can actually do things like install uh, structure protection and sprinklers. You wanna identify any hazards that are contiguous like dense forests unmowed grasses, shrubs bordering the roots, or other hazards such as dangerous trees, power lines that could come down, fuel tanks that, that could, could be close to fire that could hinder emergency response and act, a, evacuation from the property. And you want to be aware of the potential danger of burning trees falling and contacting power lines along access routes and charging the route. So it, it, these are awareness things. A lot of people don't think about them. But if you think about fire responders coming onto your property, can they get there safely? Are there hazards that they could be threatened by? If there are, you want to take steps to mitigate those hazards. Very important element in, in what we're talking about today. So again, last week when we were talking about planning, we talked about prioritizing your structures and uh, what is the most important structure on your farm or ranch property for the integrity of your business or for you living on that property. So you wanna focus on critical structures, assets, 
where wildfire impacts would severely limit the sustainability of your operation. Uh, and you're thinking about vegetation management, where are there ember traps? Uh, moving, ideally, if you have debris, you want to move it to a safer location. The same thing with fuel sources like propane, you want them away from your critical structures. And you want to make sure that that structure is hardened, eliminating pathways to burning those buildings by creating defensible space and limiting em embers from entering into uh, flammable spaces. So we talk about removing combustibles. Um, within FireSmart, there are currently four zones. There's zone 1A, 1, 2, and 3. And really, the 1A zone is the zone 1.5 meters away from your building. And the zone 2 is the 10 meters around your structure. And those are the two most important uh, zones within the FireSmart program. That's really you know, if, 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 if you're thinking about working on your property, you want to work from the zone A out and get zone 1A and 1 done and get them in, in good shape so that they, they, they won't, there aren't ignition sources, there aren't ways for fire to move to your primary structures, and that firefighters have got a safe zone for fighting that fire. So the guidebook provides an overview of the, the fire smart zones, and the workbook has a section for action planning, for writing down the actions. But ideally, you're removing combustible vegetation and other materials around the agricultural operation, um, so, such that the structure, it, it, you know, structure protection um, is, is, is completed. So removing those combustible materials around the animal barns is especially important if that structure will be used to shelter livestock in place. If your house is part of the property and that's your center of business operations, obviously that structure is a priority. Um, you, sorry, you want to also consider uh, risk to wood power poles and gas and power lines if, if, if they are at risk, which are often surrounded by grass fields. Preventative measures include uh, putting your propane tank 10 meters away from the home or building and running the propane through a copper pipe underground. Uh, you might consider using the aluminum sheeting around the bottom meter of a, of a wood pole system or other methods to protect wood poles is uh, using a corrugated, um, a corrugated uh, pipe uh, around the base and filling it with, uh, with gravel such that it insulates from serious heat damage. Um, additional details, um, we talked about that one, one a zone from the structure where you want non-combustible materials. We've got the, the zone one, which is 10, the 10 meters. And then there's two more zones. If, if, if you really feel like you've got hazards around the property, you're isolated from uh, an emergency response group, you may well want to go out the full um, 100 meters that's recommended in FireSmart, um, depending on what resources that you have. But in zone two and three, really your focus is not to cut down all the trees, but removing that flammable vegetation to prevent surface fires from spreading. So when we talk about uh, surface fire, we want to remove the material that's uh, less than six inches or less than 12 and a half centimeters in, in size. And that will re remove the ignition hazard and will remove the ability of fire to spread rapidly um, into zone one. And ideally, if the crowns are touching or you've got uh, ladder fuels that go to the ground. You want to increase those ladder fuels above two meters and you want to space the crown so that they're the outer, outer crown, uh, outer crown is three meters away from the next tree. Usually, you know, five, five to six meters apart, depending on the size of the tree. So, and as part of your planning, you want to write down the actions, what you're going to do, how you're going to do it. You're going to remove deadfall. You're going to clear vegetation from critical fence lines, and you're going to maintain that 10 meter fuel free buffer around corrals as well, if you can. You want to dispose of the cut vegetation safely, obviously within compliance of the regulation. And, you know, ultimately when we think about zone three, that further out zone, we're trying to reduce the, the vegetation levels um, such that we dumb down the fire behavior potential. We're not going to necessarily stop fire, but we want to reduce the intensity 
the rate of spread of the wildfire. And really that's done by removing those fine fuels and, and reducing the crown closure and the, and the uh, height to live crown. So here's, uh, if, if you were listening last week, uh, we, we looked at this particular operation in, in the boundary. Here you can see the priority structures and the 10 meter zone around each one in orange. And then you can see the, uh, the zone two in yellow. And you can see it largely encompasses, the zone two largely encompasses the full facility. So this, this is kind of, as I said, zone one is your priority, but if you can get to zone two or zone three, that's great. Your, your, your structures and your operation are that much better protected. Um, so what are some hazardous fuels? People look at different fuels and they don't, they're not really aware of what is hazardous. Obviously on the right hand picture, a lot of grass there, uh, very low moisture content, and that's signified by its bread. Basically, has no moisture. This is a really uh, easily ignited fuel, and it spreads very rapidly. And so, it reduces the time you have to respond to a fire. So, if you have this next to your fences, which also can burn, you're going to see fire move very quickly along the fence line supported by that fire along the fence line. So you want to remove those fine ignitable combustibles that rapidly spread, rapidly ignite and spread fire. So in this case, I would probably want to run a, a line of four or five meters along that fence where I mowed that grass that you can see in the picture. Um, the lower left, that's what I call lots of some fine, fine fuel that would contribute to spread and growth of a fire. So that's all that material that's less than, than six inches, 12 and a half centimeters, very high loading in that picture, not something that you want any, anything around your structures that you're trying to protect or in any way create a conduit for fire to move onto your property. Uh, the upper left-hand photograph is a picture of a dense forest where you can see that the crown closure between trees is fully integrated. The live crown goes right to the ground. So you've got lots of ladder fuels that are gonna move fire from the ground into the crowns and given the density and amount of fuel there you would have a difficult time controlling the fire in that particular circumstance. Here's some other types of fuels that often occur on ranch properties so you can see in the upper left some just piles that need to be burned in an ember, ember shower they would all be ignited and you'd have these very hot fires burning on the property uncontrollably creating more embers than just the wildfire itself. The pallet pile, obviously embers get into that pile, it's gonna start the pile on fire. These large accumulations of, of fine dry grass woody debris in the fence line you can see below. And then you can see a bunch of garbage, old tires, plastic uh, mixed with grass and other things. This pile gets on fire and it's gonna be very difficult control and is gonna be a hazard for anybody that's uh, trying to respond to an emergency on, on, a, on a given property. Hazardous fuels near infrastructure and fuel pathways. So here you have in the top up left two barns. They're connected with a wood fence. That's a conduit to move fire between the two buildings. You've got an open space where you can see hay in there. Um, the only option you really have in this circumstance is to sprinkle the building and maybe cover the entrances with poly and open the gate. That would be uh, something that you could do ahead of the fire. You can see here some propane down in the lower left. You've got cardboard boxes in an accumulated space. And then you've got wood and sawdust that all would be, all of the, all, all three of the, the, the things would be subject, three of the pictures, the barns, the cardboard boxes and the wood would be subject to an ember shower. The propane is more the direct flame contact from the forest. And ideally it's 10 meters away from a building. So the, the, these are important hazards to identify in your property and to mitigate. Um, Opportunities and best practices for reduction, um, unique to agriculture. Obviously, uh, you have tools on your facility that you can use to help um, mitigate some of these fuels. So employing agriculture best practices and man management strategies includes irrigation, uh, selective and intensive grazing, mowing, tilling, and brushing. And all of these uh, things are, are focused on reducing the loading and, and wildfire threat. I think it's important to recognize that there are many agricultural practices applied selectively, can be applied selectively intent and intentionally, and that they can achieve fuel reduction. And 
ultimately the next slides that I'm going to show you are going to speak to some of these considerations. Um, the BC Wildfire Service has produced a fact sheet on open burning practices for farmers and ranchers and it has lots of valuable information to help conduct open burning safely. It also provides vegetation management tips that use or incorporate agricultural practices to manage fuel hazards. I think I, I spoke about this last week. Um, I'm very reluctant to recommend that people do burning on their property just because in the last few fire seasons there's been so many escapes and there's a lot of litigation that's being uh, undertaken to recover costs associated with those fires. So if you start an intentional fire on your property, it spreads off your property on the Crown land, you can be liable for a contravention under the Wildfire Act and, and, and uh, regulation. And those contraventions are up to 100,000 or more. Uh, you can also be uh, subject to cost recovery for the cost of fire, the fire. And those numbers are, are absolutely staggering. I had uh, a fire that I worked on last year that was $15.6 million. And it wasn't really a, a really large fire, but it, it burned up a lot of crown timber. So you're not only, you're not only responsible for the firefighting cost, but you also could be hooked on the hook for damaging crown resources like timber or habitat or those kind of things. And then finally, if you do have to defend yourself, the cost of litigation, uh, both at an opportunity to be heard or an appeals commission hearing is extensive. And in many cases, people have been bankrupted by this process. So if you're gonna burn, you better be safe in doing that. And you better be following all of the uh, outlined actions that are required under the Welfare Act and regulations. Specifically, if you're burning piles, one of the things that I've noticed is a lot of people think, oh, I can burn on snow and they don't guard the pile properly. And then the next thing they know in the spring when the snow has gone, there's a hot spot left in the pile and the hot spot escapes to nearby fuels and they're not in compliance because they didn't put a fire guard around the pile. If you're gonna burn on your property, I would suggest that you have an area of mineral soil of two to five meters around whatever burn area you have to ensure that the fire can't creep and spread uh, from the pile uh, onto your greater property and off the property. Ultimately, practices and strategies to reduce fuel loading and, and wildfire threat, they include, and, I, and I've talked about some of these already, dry grass, hay fields and pasture lands, you wanna reduce the grass, the stubble, and prevent the fire from spreading. In the top picture, you can see the fire is largely gonna sp spread all around the property. Now, you don't have to mow all of the grass, but certainly if you wanna protect the fence line, you wanna, you wanna mow the grass next to the fence line. So grazing, mowing, or tilling near to or next to building sites, uh, outside the perimeter of the pasture, um, cut hay fields, those are all good areas to undertake practices to mitigate risk. Obviously your fence lines and ditch lines are, are spreading conduits. So you wanna, you wanna mitigate the fuels around those. And you, you, you also wanna mitigate around um, your corral lines. So when I talk about mitigation, I, I'm suggesting you cut grass. Um, you wanna make sure none of these fuel types are right next to your building. And if you have any hay fields next to the yard, you wanna cut them as late in the season as possible and minimize regrowth. You may wanna mow a strip next to a building site to act as a fire guard. You may wanna allow your, your livestock to graze right next to buildings and, and eat up that fine fuel. Or you may wanna till the outside of pasture land to really create a fuel break. Um, typically fence lines and ditches have large accumulation of grass and weeds that need to be brushed. Um, otherwise they, they form a wick and they carry intense and quick spreading fires that I've talked about. So you wanna manage the, the, the fire around that fence line. Feed storage. These areas obviously are susceptible to ember shower, ember showers. So, and hay barns are one of the biggest ember traps because they contain so much uh, cured fuel. And ultimately farmers like the air to keep the hay field or the hay and the feed dry. And it's generally not reasonable to move it. It's expensive to move the stuff around. So uh, one of the ways you can mitigate for this is if, if you have a wildfire event um, that's threatening your property, you can hang poly, um, uh, especially a rolled up tarp as a temporary measure. You can hang it on a roll and then just let it down in the event of an emergency. And that poly will eliminate the embers 
from coming into the building. Uh, if a water supply is not an issue on the property, then the tarps can be um, further secured using a sprinkler system. So you can have the tarp and a sprinkler system operating to protect the building. Um, and, and ultimately you wanna have adjacent grasses and vegetation mowed next to the building so fire can't spread underneath or to the edge of the structure and start the structure on fire. So we're gonna talk now, oh, I see that there's something in the chat. An alternate to burning is compost or covering the piles with dirt. Doesn't take much to dig down a bit. Yeah, that, that's a really good point. Um, so, so you can cover or compost your pile rather than burning. And ultimately it's, uh, it's, it, it's a, you're just really composting rather than burning. And I agree and support that. Um, as long as you're not creating a situation where you might have spontaneous combustion in the pile. So sometimes you get a lot of heat generated in these compost piles. Um, so, so you gotta be cautious that they don't heat up and, and begin smoldering and start a fire. So the fire smart manual um, really outlines hardening off strategic assets and structures. And really, as I said earlier, it's a long-term strategy. If you're not fire smart now, you're not gonna probably turn your property around to fire smart immediately. But as you do renos or construction, you want to make sure that you're using fire resistant materials. In the shorter term, you can be proactive by doing regular maintenance and cleaning of things like gutters and roofs of accumulations of combustible material. Um, and ultimately you want to have some form of fire resistant roofing. You want fire resistant uh, siding and you want to clean, cl close or screen eaves and vents with three millimeter mesh because uh, fire can enter into those, uh, into those spaces. Sprinklers. Uh, we talked about sprinklers last week. Um, again, key considerations are, uh, is the use of sprinklers appropriate for your property? Do you have enough water supply? Do you have a source of energy that's going to power the sprinklers? Uh, again, we talked about identifying the priority structures. And the reason for that is it's not always capable for a structure protection, structure protection unit to be able to set up their sprinkler system for all of your buildings. Their resources may be strapped and they really want to focus on uh, protecting those most important buildings. So in your plan, you want to create, create a schematic with instructions for setup, layout, and activation of a sprinkler system if you have your own. Um, ideally, you want to, we talked about identifying uh, power sources, water availability, um, all of those kind of things. And you need to try and understand how long, what's the length of times that sprinklers need to operate to provide protection for your structures. Um, and finally, recognize the constraints and triage protocols um, for provincial sprinkler protection units deployed by BC Wildfire Service. I see again, there's another chat question. What is the rating of new asphalt singles, shingles? Um, ultimately, asphalt shingles are class A, uh, class B roofing material. So they are a rated material that is not combustible during a fire event. So as long as the main roof is covered with uh, sound shingles, it should be protected. Uh, I, I agree that metal uh, would be preferred, but shingles are adequate as well. Uh, metal roofing, if you're changing a roof, I know this from... Uh, uh, a condominium that a development that that I'm part of in in, uh, in Whistler. We're talking about changing to a metal roof for fire smart purposes. We currently have a shake roof, but your roof may have to be re-engineered to hold the weight of a metal uh, roof. So a metal roof can be really expensive to change over, particularly if you have to re-engineer re the structure to hold the weight of that metal roof. Water supply, again, we talked about sufficient water supply to, um, to, uh, to, 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 your, to your sprinkler system. As I said, you need enough water to last about two hours and you need enough fuel or power. And, and so if your power is electrical, if your power goes down, you're not gonna be able to pump that water. The other consideration is if you live in a, uh, a dry climate, your well or your water source may not be able to sustain the amount and length of time you need the water for. So you need to review that and consider it carefully in developing your plan. 
And you may have to augment, as I talked about last week, by putting some cisterns or, or a dugout or something where you can store water specifically to protect your, your facility in a wildfire. Another point, we, we talked about this last week, ideally your plan has locations of the water supply, the water hookup, and the sprinkler setup locations. So if um, first responders or, or BC Wildfire Service on their property, they know where you, you want to uh, pr protect your property. Um, good question from Megan. Um, do solar panels survive wildfires? Uh, if those solar panels are on a roof that uh, burns, uh, very unlikely. Uh, if those solar panels are uh, adjacent to the property and away from structures and it's fire smart, uh, there's a better chance. I have a friend in Caslow that's mounted his solar panels on an independent frame away from the house in the middle of his yard and it wouldn't be subjective to an ember shower. So probably better not to mount your solar panels on the house if you think there's a possibility of an ember shower threatening your property. The other thing is, I, I mean, I, I, I would assume that sprinklers aren't gonna harm that, but uh, anyway, that's good. Um, uh, obviously you wanna risk, uh, reduce risk to your range level assets. So if you have a cattle operation and you're putting your cattle out on the range, what do you do to protect those critical assets on, on crown tenures? Well, range assets may include your fencing, your corrals, your troughs, your loading areas, your evacuation routes, uh, and safe spaces. So you want to evaluate all of these critical things that you need and apply fuel treatments where it makes sense to protect those assets from burning. So you can see in this example in the top photo, uh, someone's corral is burning from a fire. Um, ideally, if they had done some fuel management around that, potentially they could have saved it. If you've got heavy fuels that are near to that asset, you may want to thin them. Uh, if they're on Crown land, however, you require a permit and you must meet the regulatory requirements. So you need advice from either um, Ministry of Agriculture or Ministry of Forest before you start undertaking significant fuel modifications around your structures and fences on Crown Range. And ultimately you want to prioritize, as I said earlier, you don't need to take out all of, all of the fuel. You really need to be focused on the fine fuel. And the fine fuel, as I described earlier, is materials that are less than 12 and a half centimeters in diameter or six inches. So what are the key risk reduction on property key messages? Really start simple and work out from critical structures. So identify those critical structures, work on those first, work on that 10 meter priority zone one. Remove the fine fuels, as I said, it's the conduit for initiation and propagation of fire. And if you remove it, you'll be uh, much better off. And, and as I said, be strategic. Don't underestimate fire embers. 50% of homes that burn typically are ignited by embers. Um, think about a sprinkler system and how it's going to work on your property. Think about how you're going to uh, ensure safe ac access, both for first responders and for you exiting the property. As I suggested, identify hazards, propane and fuel sources, fertilizers, pesticides. We've heard of people storing dynamite, dynamite on their property, ammunition. Put those places well away from your priority structures in a safe place. You do not want those in the structures that firefighters or emergency responders have to attend to. And ultimately eliminate those fuel pathways, those pathways that fire can move along and go from building to building or structure to structure. Those are very important um, considerations. So all of these things combined, if you focus on them, you're really gonna make a big difference in protecting your property and making it more resilient to both uh, fire contact on the property and to an ember shower. Um, so we're gonna talk, I'm gonna, I'm gonna re-emphasize again, thinking about safe and legal considerations with burning. Remembering that my recommendation is if you have a small operation, you don't have a lot of equipment and you don't have a lot of experience, I wouldn't burn. You need, and before you burn, just to make sure you know all the rules, make sure that you read the Wildfire Act and Wildfire Regulation. 
specifically the clauses on fire use, prevention and control, you want to understand your liabilities. There are huge fines and cost recovery measures that exist within the Wildfire Act, and it's really important that you understand what those are. You, if, if you need to, you should seek government guidance, and you should understand if there's any interpretive building. So sometimes BC Wildfire Service issues guidance when we have a drought or uh, when typically people burn and they don't want people burning. And there's also seasonal information in bulletins. So it's really important to recognize those things. Um, and just so you know, this year, I would suggest that we are particularly vulnerable to backyard burning. Uh, we had 29% of normal precipitation in March. And I can tell you that most of British Columbia is in moderate right now, a moderate hazard. And again, April has been a very low month for precipitation. And I think we're setting up right now, unless we have significant rains in June, we're gonna have a difficult fire season. And I, I would not be advocating or promoting that any one of you be thinking about burning on your property. Usually the best time to burn is the fall ahead of some big precipitation system, not the spring because in the spring fires, if it dries out, tends, tend to hang over and they can reoccur at later times after the fire, after, after, after that spring burn period. Remember also that if you're conducting industrial activities, and that means using a chainsaw, using uh, equipment, uh, using anything with a gas engine is an industrial activity or grinding. And if you are using an industrial activity within 300 meters of the forest or of a grassland, and you start a fire, you're subject to a contravention and cost recovery under the Wildfire Act. Um, last year in Squamish, there was some backyard burning in a time in April that absolutely shocked me. Um, the fire left the property, burned into some adjacent forest land, took out uh, a significant right away of um, hydro distribution lines and probably is gonna be in the millions of dollars in terms of losses and costs to su suppress that fire. So I, I'm, I'm not, I, I don't wanna scare you, but uh, you need to really be on top of what your liabilities are as they relate to um, what, using prescribed fire on your property. I've also put um, some, on the BC Wildfire Service website, you'll see there are open fire prohibition restrictions listed, fire prevention and industry operators um, uh, link and wildfire legislation. That's all on the BC Wildfire website. And uh, if, if you go to the, that website, you'll be able to look at the specifics around some of the things that can, can, can go wrong. So BC Wildfire Service also puts out uh, uh, a link on open fire regulations and really um, it outlines the considerations and challenges when using open burns to clear grass, stubble, debris piles, et cetera. Uh, you need an open burn, uh, you need to obtain a burn registration number. You need to understand the current uh, conditions, weather, venting, index, fire, uh, fire uh, danger. You have to comply with the, the regulations and you have to be the, aware, as I said, of da dangerous holdover fires or fire escapes. And ultimately you wanna employ fire smart open burning practices to help uh, limit escapes. Uh, and one last thing, there is an open burning smoke control regulation. It's referred to as OBSCAR. If you're burning near residential homes uh, or um, in a community, you need to comply with OBSCAR before you can burn. So we're gonna get into considerations as it relates to um, uh, what to do during an emergency. So, Obviously, you, you may know of or be aware of a fire in vicinity of your property. So um, ultimately, you want to monitor what that fire is doing. So you want to become familiar with the various sources of reliable information in advance. So which agencies are going to put that information on their websites? How do you access it? You want to be aware of misinformation or inaccurate information via social media. You want to recognize the roles of uh, various key agencies in a wildfire. Uh, you want to recognize uh, the roles of various key agencies. 
um, and in, in that emergency. And you want to be prepared to, and arm yourself with as much accurate and useful, useful information as possible to determine the right actions that you need to undertake to implement um, elements of your wildfire plan. So some of the best sources of information include local independent radio stations. CBC is always on top of fires. Um, you will find that there's wildfire updates in, on regional district websites. Regional districts typically have emergency call centers. You can speak with the BC Wildfire Service. Drive BC often has notifications about fires. Uh, BC Hydro may have, and Environment Canada obviously has weather warnings and uh, talks or outlines issues related to smoke emergencies. So you want to understand that there are three phases of evacuation. There is an evacuation alert, which is a warning issued that there is potential imminent threat to life and property. And that's really the time that you should be uh, actively moving to leave your property. Once an order comes down, you're absolutely forced and it's an enforced issue that you have to leave. I would suggest you're in much better condition if you can leave during that alert phase. There'll be less panic, there'll be more organization. So this is your farm plan should identify the key things that you need to do once an evacuation alert has been issued and what you need to do to lock down your facility to protect it from that fire. Very important. Um, we introduced this in workshop A, but it's really important that you understand. And then you're not allowed typically to go back unless the evacuation order is rescinded or you cooperatively work with uh, RCMP and the, the Emergency Operations Center to let you back in to attend your farm. But that's a case by case issue, very specific to the complexity and size of the wildfire and whether or not they feel they can protect your uh, personal safety. You may at that uh, evacuation alert phase wanna create a fire break or uh, redeploy your irrigation system or plow some weeds or, or wet areas um, to create breaks around your property. Or you may be thinking about that before the fire season even. So, but at the time of the fire, if you know where it's coming from, you know the direction that it's likely gonna come to your property, it is a good strategy to develop some fire breaks in, in, along the property. Um, and you can use your equipment. Um, you can create a, a reduced vegetation strip with a, a tractor or plow around the perimeter or around structures and or you could use your irrigation system to wet down an area ahead of that fire front. Obviously uh, backup power uh, if you're talking about running your facility or running a, a pump system you want to make sure that if the electrical system goes down that you have backup for critical parts of your operation. Um, and you want to gather equipment needed to provide the backup power. So ideally, you know where to get it or you have it on site. You want to set those backup generators in place and connect them so they're ready to start. And you want to start the generators and test the system for at least an hour and have instructions available in case a first responder has to initiate uh, backup power when you, you're not there. So you may late leave the site without backup power in place. But it, you should be able to instruct somebody how to install your backup power systems and, and run them during that emergency. Livestock protection planning, we talked about that uh, the other day. Obviously, you want your livestock inventory. You want to know where you're going to locate them, whether you're going to locate them on, on the facility or, or, or move them. Um, and you've got those four key options that we talked about. Uh, we talked about premise ID. Premise ID exists today, but will become mandatory next year in 2020. If you don't have premise ID, I highly advise that you apply for it because it will be mandatory if you want to enter onto your property during a wildfire event in the future. And it's a very, uh, it will be a good tool and is a good tool moving forward. And the primary, remember, we, we highlighted this at the planning stage, the primary responsibility for livestock protection lies with the individual operation. So what are those options? Shelter in place, move livestock to an on-farm safe location, 
relocate livestock off the farm, or if they're on range, you want to open the gates and cut fences to free the animals. And uh, ultimately, you're just you just want to provide uh, the the high level detail. So you want to you want to pre-plan for different wildfire scenarios from a small immediate fire on your property to that large landscape fire that may require a full evacuation. And ultimately, you're going to document that within, within the framework of, of your wildfire plan, and, and you're going to use the guide to assist you in, in sorting that out. So sheltering uh, the livestock in place, again, we talked about that. Most important for dairy herds and large poultry flocks, uh, you want to make sure the combustible materials have been removed. Obviously, your facility, you, I, I'm hoping that it's fire resistant, because if it's not, you really only have sprinkler protection uh, available to protect it. And that you want uh, water pumps for sprinkler system and that they have uh, associated backup power. All of those elements are, are key to making sure that livestock's protected under a shelter in, in place or a sheltered livestock farm. Um, additional considerations, uh, is the fire smart and sprinkler protected structures identified in map in your plan? Do your animals have access to, to uh, food, water, ample living space? Um, do you have a support system connected to backup power that will be reliable if you can't be on the facility for several days? And do you have sufficient time, capacity, and resources to move livestock to a protected barn if they're not in one at the time the fire is announced? So these are all really important things to think about ahead of that fire coming to your facility. Um, you might want to move your livestock to an on-site safe outdoor location. Um, again, there were some key considerations we talked about in terms of building your plan. Has the field been recently irrigated or fire breaks in place? Is the, is the area of ample size and buffered from the fire? Has the field been heavily grazed or cut so that you're not it's not going to carry fire and is there fencing in place and is fencing necessary for that livestock i'm sorry i can only go so long without having any water so moving livestock to on-site safe outdoor locations obviously again access to food water ample living space for three days is recommended and you have the sufficient time and capacity and resources to move that livestock from uh, your facility onto that safe place uh, what are safe guidance for outdoor areas? Obviously, uh, you need ample size, uh, an acre or 0.5 of a hectare as a buffer from the fire. You, you should be at least 100 meters from the timber and or fuel breaks that are in place. And you want to make sure that the area that you shelter them in or that you locate them to is free of combustible fuels. Um, it's heavily grazed out, it's cut or it's irrigated. And ultimately, you've got to think about hazards like barbed wire, overhead power lines, or other potential falling hazards that could impact that area that you're, uh, you're housing in for that, that safe period. Relocating livestock, obviously, uh, when you're ahead of relocating, you want to identify and form agreements with one or more buddy farms in advance. You want to consider the potential reach of a landscape level fire coming to your property. Some of these fires uh, are, are tens of thousands of hectares. The Binta fire in 2004 ran 40,000 hectares in one night. So you need to be thinking about large scale uh, fire potential. And if you're, you're uncertain about that, you should consult the BC Wildfire Service, but certainly you've got to be thinking about locating your animals outside your existing drainage. Um, at, at a minimum, I would say, if, if, if there's a threat of a landscape. You need to identify the needs, the challenges, and the constraints, and prepare to make arrangements and document as much as possible in advance. As we said when, when we talked last week, having the plan so that you can move quickly in an organized fashion on all of these issues is fundamental to the success of execution. So you need to consider these things, the IDs of the animal, um, what options you have for relocation, um, do you have a, a, a quick method for identifying your, your animals without brands or ear tags? And ultimately, identifying those uh, needs, constraints, and challenges and plan accordingly are the, are the fundamentals to protecting 
your animals. So uh, we talked about the evacuation order, uh, evacuation alert. Obviously, if you think you're gonna have to move your animals, the time to do it is before the evacuation order. So you've got to make a judgment, but better be safe than sorry. Get those animals off your facility before the fire's at your doorstep and you're being forced to evacuate because you probably won't have time to do a major evacuation. You want to understand uh, the, that you're not going to get a lot of support from, from local government. There isn't a lot of support to help you evacuate your animals. So you, you really need to be prepared to do it independently. And you want to be aware of the current policies and procedures as it relates to financial support um, during that evacuation phase. You, uh, if, you're, if, you're, if your animals are on range, you don't want to cut the gates if you're going to create traffic headaches for people trying to safely get out of the area. You want to make sure that your animals are ID'd. You want to map in your wildfire plan of the location of gates and location where you can cut fences just in the event that you're not the person that needs to do that and or you need to instruct somebody to do that. Um, it, it's for information for emergency response crews and again I want to highlight you don't want to open those gates in ha heavy traffic areas as is highlighted in, in the top photo here. Okay, now we're going to move. We've got two more sections to go, I think. And uh, I'm hopeful I can get through these in the next 15 to 20 minutes and leave some time for questions. So uh, when we're thinking about our operation, we need to think about personal employee and visitor evacuation planning. Uh, many operations have staff that support them or they're operating an agritourism uh, facility, a winery or some other facility that's attracting people to the property. So when local governments or the province issues an order, all persons must leave the defined area. And in the wildfire plan and workbook, we describe the actions and steps producers are encouraged to take to safely and quickly evacuate from their property. Um, and, and ultimately, we also summarize the recommendations of a grab and go kit, the, the essential information that you want to take and a car kit are as described as well. So ultimately, producers have to anticipate that they may not be allowed to return without a permit, as I discussed earlier. And so having the right identification documentation will assist in validating the operation status of the, the farm or ranch. And you want to under, un, identify the key personnel, demonstrate preparedness, all of which may help you as an individual operator obtain a permit to return and attend to essential services on your property. Um, and you must also anticipate how separated individuals will be able to check in with each other once they've dispersed and are encouraged to a designated common check-in. Um, so in other words, we had, we've had examples of producers that have got multiple properties with multiple individuals undertaking the harvest on those properties. And they don't necessarily come back to the same place before they get evacuated. And so your evacuation requires communication, organization, and a lot of elements that you've got to think through before that uh, event takes place. Remember, an uh, evacuation event is likely to be chaotic. So again, the more organized you are, the better are you prepare or are prepared the smoother these evacuations are going to go. So that evacuation plan needs to outline the roles and responsibility. Who's the decision maker, the coordinator? Who is going to be the primary individual at each property? Who's going to be the backup, et cetera? So visitor evacuation will primarily be a concern for agritourism operations or other agricultural operations that receive a significant number of visitors. And it may be applicable to operations with uh, on-site wineries, restaurants, you picks, on tours, uh, on-site tours, or accommodation and farm, farm gate or other retail sales. All of those types of facilities have to be thinking they're gonna have somebody on their property that potentially they're gonna have to provide evacuation instructions to. Employee uh, evacuation is important consideration and it's particularly important for agriculture operations with large numbers of full-time or seasonal employees on site during the wildfire season. And in some cases, these 
employees may be residing on site. There may be multiple sites, multiple properties and operations are, uh, and all these are, are, are complicating factors that make that evacuation exercise difficult to, uh, to enact. If you employ out of province personnel, obviously you wanna provide documentation to confirm their employment at your operation in order for them to be eligible to receive assistance. And you wanna keep an employee list and an employee identification record centralized um, in your grab and go um, system. And you wanna consider any barriers to communication, whether that's language and develop an appropriate mode of communication. So in our cherry uh, orchard example that we've been using, they, they provided a fact sheet that was written in French for seasonal workers from Quebec. So this un underlies the importance of building a communication plan with who to communicate and the responsibilities of that communication plan. Um, I see a question from Megan and it says, do emergency personnel for those managing have procedures in place to really be able to facilitate? Um, ultimately, we have seen uh, agriculture support, uh, Ministry of Agriculture support that have given direction to BC Wildfire Service to cut gates, open fences for certain range tenure holders. So um, it's important for you to communicate those with your local ag representative in the event that that process could be facilitated. So if you're in communication with your uh, Minister of Agriculture range person, um, you, you can communicate some of these important details about your operation and they may be able to provide them to uh, an EOC. So there has been examples specifically of, of where that has worked. Um, so again, in the workbook, we've provided a sample communications plan and I don't want to dwell on it, but you can see it identifies documenting employees, visitors, local government emergency operations, BC wildfire service, et cetera. Um, and documenting the exits and evacuation routes uh, should be fairly straightforward. I don't want to dwell on this too much, but having a, a good map that like we talked about in, in the last exercise. And ideally, if you've got a lot of people on your facility, you probably want to conduct a mock evacuation annually or per periodically to, uh, for staff, especially when you've got staff changeover and different levels of experience. And you want to integrate the wildfire evacuation training and hazard awareness for employees into your uh, worksite safety program. Um, so simplified user-friendly versions of the evacuation plan can be distributed to employees at the time of orientation. So that's really an important thing to consider. And again, uh, I've already highlighted it. You want to document uh, you confirm and document before an evacuation. Running an evacuation without a plan is uh, asking for chaos and a disaster. So you want a system for accounting for employees and visitors. You want emergency shutoff procedures for your utilities, equipment, and processes. You want procedures for assist assisting individuals with disabilities. And you want all to make sure that all employees are aware and informed of that evacuation plan and that it can be effectively communicated to visitors. These are all really important elements. Um, you also want a map or information about the site level and operation wide considerations that you need to consider for that evacuation plan. This is uh, a cherry orchard operation as I previously referenced. These are all the different orchards that are picked at different times during the season. And you can imagine that each one of these has got, you know, different numbers of people harvesting cherries. And if a fire threatened them all at one time, evacuation needs to be planned and coordinated. Um, here's another example. Um, this is the, the, the headquarters of that cherry operation. And these are the important elements of evacuation for that facility. The marshalling point, where the residents uh, on site is, the emergency shutoff points, where are employees housed on site, and there, you can see there's cabins and there's a, a site where they can be, where the hazardous materials are, uh, the packing house, and all, all of these details are really important for first responders in, uh, in addressing threats to a specific property. So we're in the home stretch here. Um, 
So everyone is interested to know if their farm or ranch is impacted by uh, a fire, uh, what assistance is available to them. And I think primarily, number one, your insurance is the most important thing. And so we identified issues when we did some of this or original uh, workshopping that individuals uh, hadn't really thought about their insurance requirement wholeheartedly. So that cherry operation that I, uh, I just showed you had a cold storage facility and a packing house and a large majority of their crop was stored in that facility uh, through the fire season. So if they weren't allowed to tend to the property or if the buildings had been damaged, I asked the question of whether their crop would have been protected under insurance and they didn't know. So I went back and did a, a whole review of that and uh, they adjusted their insurance accordingly. The other thing I've learned about insurance during fire seasons is that insurance companies will not renew a policy if a fire threatens your operation within 100 kilometers during the fire season. So I, I advise everybody that when you renew your insurance, you do it in the winter time. Don't do it during fire season because there's been some hanky panky that's been played by some of these insurance companies to limit their liability. Um, obviously, if your facility is impacted, you'll need a damage assessment and you'll have to think about recovering uh, from that event. So considerations, really what type of insurance is best for you? If you're burning on your property, I'm gonna tell you to make sure you've got some firefighting insurance under your comprehensive liability policy. Um, even starting a fire from a truck or a hazardous activity you, you, and it escapes off your property, it's sure nice to have some of that burning insurance if, 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 if it's available. Be clear on what's covered and excluded. So you really need to think about all the elements of your operation. And if one of them was to go down during a fire, what would that mean to your, to your crop? What would that mean to your animals? What would be your potential losses and how would you mitigate them? Um, so farm management weighs heavily in determining your insurance eligibility, eligibility and premiums. A wildfire plan demonstrates due diligence to an insurance agent or brokers. Insurers expect you to take reasonable steps to protect yourself. So consider the timing of your policy renewal, as I suggested. It may not be able to, to per, you may not be able to purchase a new policy or coverage if there's a wildfire within your specific area. And I, again, I, I used 100 kilometer, kilometers. The province does not provide any funding for recovery if commercial insurance is available or was available um, before the fire and you chose not to purchase it. So ultimately you may wanna increase your de deductible. Typically a minimum is a thousand, but you have the option to increase to two or 5,000 to reduce premiums. Just like car insurance, just like house insurance, you wanna review your insurance coverage in detail to make sure that you're covered in one of these kind of emergencies. So do you have appropriate and adequate insurance in the event of a wildfire? Well, all producers within, what infrastructure and assets are covered in your policy are direct and indirect costs covered. So if you have to move your livestock, would that be covered in your policy? Are losses due to prolonged power outage due to the wildfire? So, so would you be covered if you lost power for three weeks? And do you have business income or interruption losses covered? I know in my business, I have about six months covered. If, if my building was to burn or my computer system was stolen or something like that, that would create significant business interruption and I have coverage for that. Crops, um, obviously what stages of a produ production are, are covered? Is it just the crops in the ground? Is it the harvested crop? Is it the stored crop, processed or transported product? And what if you can't harvest during an evacuation alert? Do you, or evacuation, uh, um, um, not alert, but a, a, an evacuation order uh, and you can't harvest, what does that mean? Would you, would you receive insurance coverage? The other one is if your product is tainted by smoke or uh, uh, some element of the fire. All important considerations. If you're thinking about livestock, uh, does your insurance cover uh, relocation costs? Is hay and feed covered? If there's fences damaged, if that's covered? Um, if you're a small mixed hobby, hobby farm, uh, does that come under your residential home 
owner's insurance or is that part of your farm insurance? Which provides the coverage you need? A hobby farm is really a shrunken farm and the homeowner policy may not be sufficient. You may want to be thinking about getting separate coverage for uh, your, your hobby farm. There is federal provincial risk management programs that are available to people and they're documented in the guide and I've, I've really just highlighted them here for your awareness, but there's the uh, AgroVest, the Ag Stability, the Ag Insurance and the Ag Recovery, all of these are potential areas to seek coverage after a wildfire. Ultimately, you wanna document your assets so that you can pro provide proof of what you had and what's damaged in one of these events. So you want a record of your livestock and you wanna check that livestock and you, you can, you, that you can provide for their needs. You wanna inspect the operations for hazards and damage. You wanna contact the insurance agent and report damage. You wanna document any losses in writing using inventory. You wanna take photographs and video of any damage and you wanna secure the site so it's safe post wildfire. But as I said earlier at the front end, you wanna make sure that you have a documented list and photographs of all the assets that you have on your facility in case they're destroyed by a given fire. So uh, ultimately there are different approaches to managing financial loss. There's commercial insurance, which I would suggest is the best avenue. There's government supported business risk management, including ag recovery. Um, you've got BC Di disaster financial assistance through EMBC. And there is BC wildfire suppression rehabilitation if they build guards or damage some of your property protecting it. So you can apply to those various things if, if there's been uh, impacts to your property from a fire. So that checklist for initiating insurance or other loss coverage, again, review your insurance policy, understand your coverage, your exclusions, your deductible, and the next steps for initiating a claim. You wanna review any government supported risk management that, that's available outside of your insurance policy. And you wanna make sure that you've got all the required supporting documentation to, so that you can complete and submit a claim. So that's gotta be part of your grow and go and or go in your grab and go bag to make sure that if there is damage and you, you were to lose your farm, farm documentation on farm, that you have the information to, to build a claim uh, following that fire event. So again, these are important documents that you would take with you leaving the property. Uh, thoughts around a recovery checklist, options for wildfire disaster recovery. Obviously you wanna work with neighbors to locate and identify loose animals if, if they are loose after the event. You wanna seek assistance from agricultural associations if, if you are a member or you're associated one, with one. You obviously want to work with the neighbors to get as much community uh, support as you can to get things back and up or op operational. Um, there are often community recovery information sessions post wildfire. You want to understand if you're eligible to apply for provincial disaster financial assistance. And you want to understand if you're eligible to apply for BC wildfire fire suppression disturbance rehabilitation on your property. So those are the key elements. Um, I think that ends the session and, and I think I hit it about right because I wanted to leave some time for any discussions or questions. So I, I went through the second half probably a little bit faster than I wanted to, but hopefully you got the gist and uh, I'm opening the floor for uh, questions, comments, uh, um, or anything of that nature. Again, I want to highlight uh, contacts, questions, or feedback from the session. Uh, Emily McNair is listening today. She's with the Climate Agriculture Initiative, Climate and Agriculture Initiative. You can send inquiries to me at inquiries at bablackwell.com. I want to remind you that the guide and workbook and other wildfire resource tools are available on the Climate Agriculture BC website. And ultimately, if uh, you, 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 you can subscribe to that website and get updates on these resources 
and the information is constantly being added to or updated. So uh, please, please take note of those. Um, I see there's a question and uh, where can I, I obtain premise ID? I would suggest that your best, you, you can Google it and there's, I believe there's an application online on the Ministry of Agriculture website, uh, or you can contact your local Ministry of Agriculture office. Okay, um, I'll stay on for a couple of minutes more, but uh, that ends today's session. And thank you very much for everybody for attending and thanks for the nice comments in the chat. Uh, greatly appreciated. Hope you felt that the session was valuable and that you're gonna get busy protecting your ranch or farm facility from wildfire. Cause it kind of has that feel to it this year that we might, there might be a little smoke in the air. So thanks for attending.